Welcome to Triton College's virtual lecture recital series. My name is Salvatore Siriano. I'm the lead music instructor at Triton College. Thank you for joining us this evening. I would like to introduce our panelists right now. Um, so we're joined today with Jill Lobianco Bartales, who's our visual communications coordinator and full-time faculty member at Triton College. Uh, in addition to teaching, Jill is a freelance photographer and holds an MFA in independent film and digital imaging from GSU. So hi, Jill, how are you today? Hi. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming. And then we also have a student, a fellow student from Triton. Her name is Sarah Cuevas. Sarah is enrolled in the Scholars Program at Triton. She's currently the president of the Chess Club and current vice president of service in our honors organization, Phi Theta Kappa. She will be graduating in May 2021 with an associate in science. So welcome, Sarah. We're glad you could be here. Thank you. And now I would like to introduce you to Tanika Johnson. Ms. Johnson is a visual artist and photographer mm -hmm. from Chicago's Southside Inglewood neighborhood. In 2010, she helped co-found Resident Association of Greater Inglewood, also known as RAGE, and is the lead co-founder of Inglewood Arts Collective, established in 2017. Also in 2017, she was featured in Chicago Magazine as Chicagoan of the Year for her photography of Inglewood. Within her artistic practice, Tanika often explores urban segregation and documents the nuance and richness of the Black community. Her multimedia project titled Folded Map illustrates Chicago's residential segregation while bringing residents together to have a conversation. It was exhibited at Loyola University's Museum of Art in 2018. In 2019, she was named one of the Field Foundation's leaders for a new Chicago, and most recently, she was appointed as a member of the Cultural Advisory Council of the Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events by the Chicago City Council. Welcome, Tanika. Thank you so much for coming today. Hi, thank you for having me. So I will, I will let everyone get started. So I think we'll hand it over to start with Jill. Uh, I really enjoyed your film, so thank you for sharing. Um, so I just had a couple of questions. Was there a specific time of day um, when you were shooting these images of the houses that had um, some symbolism? Yes, um, so I primarily wanted all of the homes to be shot during the daytime because I really wanted people to truly see the, the built environment around it. Um, I played with the idea of doing it at nighttime, but I felt that, you know, it wasn't going to translate as well especially given that most of the portraits of the people were also during the daytime. So I just thought to keep it consistent, I'll photograph everything during the daytime, preferably in the afternoon, not high noon because of the oh. heart. <laughs> <laughs> and um, since the project, me actually shooting the project extended from fall to the following year, um, you know, that shifted some of the afternoon times, but, but definitely uh, that was intentional. Just checking, wonderful. Um, and then also I was wondering for the photographers out there watching, what kind of gear are you working with? Oh, I'm a Nikon girl. Um, my first professional camera after my trusty Pentax K1000 in the 90s was a Nikon. And since I had accumulated a nice amount of lenses with my Nikon, I just decided to stay with it. So I still use a Nikon. Wonderful. And then are you working on any new projects right now? Or are you still continuing on with the Folded Man project? Yes. Yeah, so I am working on, well, I just completed one project called Belonging, um, which is an extension of Folded Map. And it pretty much um, examines the, um, how do you call it? The locations in Chicago where uh, nine black, eight black teenagers and one Latinx teenager uh, feel that they have been made to not belong. So basically the areas in Chicago where they have been racially profiled. So I photographed them in front of those locations as well as uh, got their audio stories of what actually happened. And that's available to view and to listen to at the website belongingchicago.com. Um, it's 
currently exhibited uh, not only online, but in the Social Justice Gallery, part of U University of Illinois Chicago. Um, but due to the pandemic, because it was scheduled to open April 9th, and as you all know what happened. Um, so it's, it's still there and we're just waiting for the world to open up again so people can go and actually view it in person. Uh, so they will probably be extending the um, exhibition for another year, especially given everything that's occurring right now. And then there is another project that I've been actively working on during the pandemic called Don't Go. Um, and that is short for Don't Go to the South or West Side. Um, it's a question that I posed to a lot of people during my presentation since the project was exhibited in 2018. And the question merely was me asking people, have you ever been told to not go to the South or West Side? And after so many times, the entire room raising their hands, um, I just thought this was an amazing phenomenon of how segregation is personally perpetuated that I really wanted to examine it further. And I invited people to email me their stories of how and when they were told to not go to the South and West sides and then what they did to disrupt it. If they took the advice, how long they took the advice and when they actually did go to the South and West side. So um, I've collected their audio stories via Zoom and I've just started photographing um, about five of the 30 participants that we interviewed. And I'm excited to, to like reveal that project, but the goal is for it to be a coffee table book. So that will take some time, um, but hopefully a corresponding exhibition, much like Belonging, where their portraits are paired with their audio stories. And um, also the folded map action kit. Um, so many people, you know, I posed the question at the end of the animation, which the animation was created during the pandemic because I was like, well, it's a multimedia project and I can't do in-person presentations anymore. Everybody's going to be online. So let me just do something creative with this. <laughs> um, but the um, action kit was in response to everyone wanting to do something and asking me like, well, what can we do? And, you know, what you can do is, is, is multi-layered. You know, it just depends on your personal comfortability and passion. Some people, you know, your action should be to, to, to vote and to learn about different aldermen, to learn about different neighborhoods. But some people want to actually visit neighborhoods so that they can either meet their map twin or just learn more about Chicago and the places that they've been told to not go. And then also for people who are on the South side, um, you know, I wanted them to also visit the North side if they haven't so that they can feel what it's like to be in an over-resourced neighborhood to know what they're entitled to as um, South and West siders. So I just created the action kit, which is a list of errands that I'm inviting everyone to run in their map twin neighborhood. Errands like go buy organic apple, see how that's different. Go buy lotion. Something so simple will reveal very different experiences. Go take out $20 from a ATM machine. Um, go visit your local library or the your map twin neighborhood's local library. So that was born out of the project as well. So those are the the three projects that I've been juggling and working on in, in, in different capacities. That sounds very exciting. And then do you ever branch out of the city? Do you, um, like Maywood is a local community around Triton College. Do you ever go out into the suburbs at all or is everything kind of centered in the city? Everything is pretty much centered in the city, but everything, um, you know, given that I try to tell people, you know, it's an art project. And although it uses the grid map and, you know, we are on a reticular grid and it's math coordinates, you don't have to stick to it. Everything in the project is applicable to any location. I encourage people, which I'm also going to create, um, to find your fold. You know, wherever segregation exists, there is usually a street, a landmark, a store, a house, something that is a dividing line. 
And um, I encourage people in other locations outside of Chicago to find it and to, you know, try to do their own folded map. So as a result of me wanting it to be applicable to other locations, um, I will be creating a guide, a find your fold guide, kind of explaining to people how I approach the project and ultimately how they can replicate it and, and share. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing. Very interesting. I really enjoyed it very much. It was really oh, a pleasure to meet you. you. Nice to meet you too. Thank you. Okay, we'll now introduce our uh, Triton student, Sarah. Uh, Sarah, if you'd like to have a little conversation with Tanika. Yes, hi. hi. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> um, well, so I'll just go ahead um, in the questions. So I have comments too. In the movie, it was mentioned that the neighborhood of Englewood had six ender aldermen. And, and I thought that someone that is not from the neighborhood would think that having that many people that residents can go to and ask for help would be like all good and everything will be solved. But however, it was pointed out that it was quite the opposite. So I wanted to ask you, Oh yeah, if you could please elaborate how it is actually a problem. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And the reason that it's a problem is because the all dramatic wards, although Inglewood has six, um, the aldermen, their wards include other neighborhoods outside of Inglewood. So mm -hmm. all six of those aldermen have a small portion of Inglewood, except um, the 16th ward, which has a nice amount. But the problem is, one, the other wards or the other neighborhoods that's included in all of the aldermen wards, sometimes they have um, higher home ownership or stronger business corridors. So when it comes to a decision of what part of your ward are you going to try to funnel money to, oftentimes they'll choose the business corridors or the neighborhoods mm -hmm. outside of Greater Inglewood that are established and that can um, immediately benefit from funding. In addition to that, uh, just take for example, if all of the residents of Greater Inglewood wanted, uh, which this is very real, this has been going on, wanted um, our main corridor, which is 63rd Street, um, to be restored with businesses. That 63rd Street runs through four wards. <laughs> so that means everyone who lives ultimately in the same neighborhood, in order for them to make change, they would all have to go to different aldermen and then have to get all of those aldermen to hopefully agree to invest in this one street that goes through all of their wards. And normally that has not been the priority for um, the existing aldermen, for them to come together and invest in a small part of their ward for the greater good of this one neighborhood that they all have a small piece in. So it just has played out to be um, kind of disenfranchisement. Uh, there isn't one alderman until recently, most recently this year, um, that has tried to rally all of the aldermen together to really focus on investing in this neighborhood that they all have a small piece in. So it can come off as um, confusing to, you know, most people would think, oh, you have more aldermen. So that means you have more people to fight for you. Well, no, because the wards include other neighborhoods that have a larger portion of any alderman's ward and they usually get the attention. So that has left Greater Inglewood to consistently over time, over many decades to kind of be ignored. Wow, that really sounds complicated. <laughs> it is. There has been a positive change um, in 2020. Um, Greater Inglewood has uh, one new alderman, um, Alderman Stephanie Coleman of the 16th Ward, and her ward actually has a lot of Inglewood. And so all of the aldermen have finally 
come together uh, to start to have the very conversation that I told you most of them weren't having over the past decade. So it has been a change in approach, um, some new blood in, in, the, in the system. So that has been a conversation. And then also Alderman Stephanie Coleman um, was just elected to be on the reparations subcommittee of the Chicago City Council. And she's sharing that uh, position with Northside Alderman Andre Vasquez, who funny enough is my friend from Lane Tech High School. <laughs> so did not surprise me that he would eventually become Alderman and um, be on the reparations subcommittee. So all of those things together um, is looking promising for Inglewood to finally get some attention around the disinvestment that has occurred over the past several decades. Well, I'm glad to hear everything is coming together. Thanks. There was also a word that stood out to me and that you mentioned a little bit of it in your answer that was disinvestment. And I wanted to ask if you could please also elaborate when in when Chicago's history did the trajectory of disinvestment started, and if you could also comment on its continued impact on your neighborhood today. Yes, another great question. Um, I'm glad that Folded Map prompted you to <laughs> even ask those questions. I, I always wanted Folded Map to kind of be an entree into people starting to think about this and your questions are so heartwarming because that's the <laughs> exact issue. Um, so with Greater Inglewood, uh, you know, just like most predominantly Black neighborhoods in Chicago, but really Greater Inglewood and the West Side neighborhoods of Lawndale and North Lawndale, um, as well as Garfield Park, but really Lawndale, um, the, the, the trauma <laughs> that occurred in both of those neighborhoods that kind of started the downward trajectory of disinvestment um, was in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, specifically the 50s and 60s. So redlining, you know, that's where the government actually graded neighborhoods according to, to race, basically saying that if a neighborhood had predominantly Black people, they would give it a grade of a D or a F. And this is the grading system that banks actually use. And so banks use this, um, these HOLC, H-O-L-C maps to determine if they were going to approve loans in these neighborhoods, home loans, business loans, any, anything like that. And so that meant that not only were black people um, like pushed into certain neighborhoods because of segregation, um, but it was supported and federally backed by these um, red line maps. And so banks did not approve mortgages or business loans to those neighborhoods. And that started what would eventually lead to an opportunity for greedy people to take advantage mm -hmm. of Black families who were trying to still find ways to become a homeowner. So there was several greedy people um, that uh, historically people refer to as blockbusters, um, basically loan sharks, who took advantage of this vulnerable population of Black people who still were trying to get homes, even though they couldn't get approved for a mortgage from a bank. Um, and they would sell homes to Black families um, under a tool called land sale contracts. And that is a very common tool. It's even still used today, but it's basically like a rent to own um, process where you pay your rent and you eventually own this home, but you don't earn equity. And equity is what determines like the whole point of purchasing a home. So a lot of these black families unknowingly purchased their home on land sale contracts, they were told it was an actual mortgage. And the reason that they were lied to is because the loan sharks were able to sell them homes at a higher market rate. And if they were to miss a payment, they would evict them. 
or they would just, you know, evict them and sell it to another family, lying to them. So Greater Inglewood has a huge number of homes, just like the West Side neighborhood of Lawndale, that were sold on these land sale contracts. So that means that, you know, I'll give an example. Today, the home ownership of Greater Inglewood is at 25%. In the 50s and 60s, if all of those Black families who thought they had mortgages actually have mortgages, um, the home ownership rate would probably be like 70% now. But they didn't. And the residents of the West Side community of Lawndale came together and you know, took it to court. They had help of um, lawyers who specialized in this. And so it made that practice illegal to use land sale contracts in this specific way. But the damage had been done. Um, the damage of these neighborhoods not having a high home ownership. And high home ownership really truly determines the economic value of a neighborhood. Most businesses don't want to put their business in a neighborhood that doesn't have high home ownership, has a lot of renters. And then in addition to segregation um, in the 50s and 60s, as a result, city services weren't deployed to these neighborhoods, like trash pickup, garbage cans, all of those things. So that changed how the neighborhood looked. And so as people started getting evicted, um, city services weren't being deployed, no new businesses were being started, that also trickled down to um, eventually the schools being underfunded because your property taxes <laughs> go directly to schools. And if you have neighborhoods with low home ownership, their schools um, don't have the opportunity to get quality investment. So all of those things over the course of 40 years, 50 years, um, lands neighborhood like Greater Inglewood in a position where um, they don't have much economic value and they don't have a strong business corridor. And all of those things stemmed from 50 years ago because of racist housing policies. And so when people talk about what systemic racism is, this is it. Um, Inglewood wouldn't be the neighborhood that it is now had racism and segrega segregation um, didn't exist. Long answer. Oh my gosh. So sorry. <laughs> it's fine. That's what we're looking for. <laughs> wow. That's, that's amazing how one little thing can go to a bigger problem. Well, now, yeah, which ultimately, you know, um, if people have that understanding and it took me getting older to, to, to connect it to my life, that is the primary reason I went to school on Chicago's North Side because the schools in my neighborhood um, weren't of a quality that my mom wanted for me. And that was the case for a lot of um, Black teenagers in the 80s and 90s, that we went to school outside of our neighborhood because of that. Yeah. Yeah, so one last question mm -hmm. is, how has Folded MAP project impacted your community in bringing awareness to the inequities that we were talking about? And have you witnessed any positive change throughout the years? Yes, so since 2018, a lot has, has happened. Um, but most importantly, which, you know, I, I hope people don't minimize the importance of it, but is, you know, conversations like this. Uh, the project has allowed me to connect with people who I wouldn't have otherwise to, to talk about this issue. And it really is that simple. The more people know, the more they can um, question just like you did. And the more they can challenge people when they hear things that are um, stereotypical or racist. A lot of people think that Greater Inglewood is just a neighborhood of um, criminals and victims of gun violence. And that isn't the case. And also people don't even understand how the neighborhood got this way. So the more people learn about it, the more people I talk to about it, the more information they can have to, to have um, more challenging conversations with people who, who say negative things. So that definitely 
has um, uh, been the greatest impact of Folded Map. And then also, um, just like this, educators being able to use it to teach their students what systemic racism is and how it's still with us today, even though none of us living right now um, created these policies or, or were part of that. Um, we're all living in it, not just the people who are in communities that are negatively impacted, but the um, segregated communities that are over-resourced. That's a result of segregation. And also more concretely, the first MAP twins that was also featured in the film, um, Wade, Jennifer, and Nanette, during the pandemic, they actually expanded Folded Map themselves and created Block Twins. They introduced their neighbors to each other. And now they have a project of their own called um, Inglewood, oh my gosh, the name escapes me. Anyway, it's a project where their, their neighbors um, like beautify a specific block in Greater Inglewood. And so all of their neighbors have met each other as of this year. And this is the result of Wade, Jennifer, and Annette's three-year friendship. So the project has expanded in that way. And then also I received some grant funding to bring Folded Map to Inglewood because it was at Loyola downtown. And um, unfortunately due to everything that I talked about in the film, there aren't many places in Chicago, I mean in Greater Inglewood where I could exhibit the project. And so I received some funding, asked my friend who is an apparel store owner in Inglewood called Inglewood Branded. Um, I asked him if I could do something unconventional and exhibit the project there. And he said, yes. And so we had an opening last November. Yes, last November. And so many people came. Um, close to 300 people came and a lot of them had never been to Inglewood before. And a lot of them purchased Inglewood branded apparel, have stayed in touch with the store and, and myself. So that is a direct impact as a result of Folded Map. Um, people went to Inglewood branded, came to Inglewood for the first time and you know got some cool hoodies and sweatshirts and, <laughs> and stuff. So so those are the the points that I most I most uh, I feel are, are the most impacted impactful. Well, it's great to hear that it has been a great impact. And it really, I think it's really interesting to hear about it because you don't hear about it every single day, even though you can see it. No, that's true, which is why I wanted to do the project because, you know, um, people have an interesting way of normalizing trauma and issues mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and Chicagoans and Chicago land people, you know, we joke about the segregation. That's how used to it we are. And normally, well, when you normalize something like that, you know, you tend to ignore it. And so mm -hmm. after the presidential election year in 2016, um, I felt like it was getting completely removed from the conversation and the focus was solely on gun violence. And I just was like, that's crazy. How are we going to talk about gun violence and not talk about how it got to be this way? So that's what prompted me to to, to do folded map. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I'll give it back to Mr. Siriano. Thank you for your great questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you, Jill, as well. Um, I'd like to take a moment just to divert and talk a little bit about your belonging project, which is currently a virtual exhibit because yes. it's like everything else with the pandemic. So, um, I'm going to share an audiogram with the audience of Lauren, and then perhaps you can speak to it after. Yeah. Okay. My name is Lauren Leggett. I am now 18 years old, and I went to Providence St. Mill High School. Lauren is a very passionate person who cares about people. She's a people person. Um, I care a lot about little details and I see meaning in everything, everything in life, but also driven and they know they will never have a dull moment with me because I just 
I'm so full of life. And um, yeah, I want to be a advocate for those who are disenfranchised. So like, um, I guess community organization, things of that nature. Um, further down the line, maybe even become senator, maybe president, who knows? <laughs> um, the small things are like becoming an English professor and just things surrounded by um, the humanities. I experience being racially profiled in businesses and stores, I would say fairly often, um, depending on where I am, more so on the north side or near downtown a lot. Um, if there's like upscale stores or really nice stores, I'll see like women who are working the floor following me around or constantly checking to see if I have everything I need. So the other day, my sister and my mom and I visited this store called H Mart and it's near Chinatown. Now my sister is a huge K-pop fan. Um, she loves Korean music. And she has also come to love their food and a lot of things about their culture. So we visited the shop to just buy a couple things that she said she had to have. Um, I'm guessing they didn't get a lot of black people because almost as soon as we walked into the store, the African-American security guard asked us with a look on his face, do you need help finding anything? And I remember my sister saying, why is the security guard asking us this? and not the people who actually work here. And my mom had to explain to her, well, sweetie, he probably thinks we're stealing. And so um, me and my sister talked about it that night and it was one of her first encounters like this. And so um, it was a little shocking that she had to see something like that. She's only like 12, um, but it was also eye-opening for her and also eye-opening for me because he was black and he still racially profiled us. Whenever I'm in these types of situations, I just choose not to judge them for being ignorant, I would say, because I know that the idea of race is pushed in American media and things like that. However, I also feel just targeted in a way. I feel sometimes angry, I'll admit, because I feel like it's unfair. But at the end of the day, I just feel like I miss seeing, like I can't even tell you who I am without first being judged. And just having that part of my identity taken from me, it makes me upset. Okay, so we're back. Um, so the scene with Lauren, you know, it captures, it captures an upsetting moment for her on multiple levels. Um, so I was just hoping you could talk just a little bit more about the significance of it in relation to your larger belonging project. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so belonging pretty much was born out of the interactions I had with teenagers, uh, who came to the Folded Map exhibit at Loyola. Um, you all saw the film, you know that the, the idea, the seed of the idea um, came to me as a teenager. And so, you know, when teachers were bringing their students to the exhibition, um, high school students, I, I would tell them this and I would say, oh my gosh, you know, like I hung out in so many neighborhoods in Chicago and they were like, no, I don't really do that. And when, when, when I do, you know, I have to be prepared to, to get harassed. And I was just like, what? And it made sense to me because, you know, I was a teenager in the 90s. And a lot of these um, policies, like the water tower, just saying last year that, you know, you can't come to the mall if you are without, if you are not with someone who's 18 and older. Um, Water Tower is one of the last malls to do this. When I was a teenager, none of the malls had that, but there's a whole generation or two or three that have grown up with that being like a rule that they know of the gang loitering laws that was just getting developed um, in my high school year. So it wasn't really implemented. Like we, we hung out. Um, but there are several, you know, generations that 
grew up as teenagers, as children, with these policing policies. And I had never thought about that <laughs> until I was talking to them. And I was like, oh my gosh, that, that would change how you interact or feel about your city or, or people even. And so I really just got so interested because I'm like, wow, these teenagers, they're going to be our future Chicago adults. Like how they get treated as teenagers will affect if they want to come back home after college or if they leave or whatever. And so I wanted to do a project that really followed Folded Map because Folded Map got such great reception that I was like, okay, okay, if we all love Folded Map this much, then we have to talk about this other stuff that we're doing. Like, we can't act like it's so unity. We're all like, no, segregation makes you have stereotypes and stereotypes make you behave differently when you encounter people that you're stereotyping. And so I really wanted to have a follow-up project to Folded Map that, that at least put that on the table for discussion. Um, and their stories, you know, when you start a project and especially, you know, I consider myself a photographer. Um, and even though I included video in Folded Map, which I didn't do the video because I just couldn't do all of those things. Um, I really thought it would be powerful to just have the photo and the audio so you don't have the distraction of of, of the moving, the hand gestures, everything that I, that made me want to capture video for Folded Map because I did audio of Folded Map. And I was like, oh my gosh, people are missing these facial expressions and these like body gestures that clearly reveal uncomfortability. So I knew that photos alone wouldn't work for that project, but for belonging, um, I felt like photo pair with audio uh, really help people focus on the individual and, and their stories. So that's what made me not only want to do belonging, but really seek out um, teenagers who had a variety of uh, racial profiling experiences um, in school. Um, unfortunately, different variations with the police. Um, at On the train. Um, so I just wanted that to to be the follow up to to folded map since it is um, a location based project. I wanted people to kind of reconcile this other thing that we do solely because of segregation. Because if you live around people um, who look different than you, have different lived experience than you. Um, you won't be so quick to make these kind of judgments. But because we're in a segregated city, it makes it very easy to do that. Yes. And, um, and you know, and I, I remember, you know, I was at one of your talks um, a couple of weeks ago through UIC, just when I was kind of, kind of prepping for this. And what struck me was one of the students who was a person of color said she dresses differently based on where she's going to go in the city. So maybe you can you know, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, one of the other stories, uh, Tesher, he's um, in belonging. Uh, he talks about that as well uh, when he's going to certain neighborhoods. Well, first of all, him and his friends have a term for certain neighborhoods that they know they're going to get harassed in as a group of young teenage black boys, they call them no-no zones. I was like, what? It's like, oh yeah, certain neighborhoods are no-no zones. I was like, I had never had, we, well, we did. We had one when I was a teenager. It was Bridgeport. I was told, don't go to Bridgeport. <laughs> um, that was a no-no zone. Um, but he even talked about having to dress different. Um, but even beyond that, he talked about just being on the train because, you know, boys tend to have a huge growth spurt in high school. So sometimes you can literally, you know, grow five inches. And he talked about um, the difference he noticed when he got taller and how him being on the train as a passenger was a completely different experience now that he was taller 
Um, and, you know, teenagers tend to create trends and, and you know, participate in trends and, and he has locks. And so um, he talked about, you know, having to keep his hands to himself, making sure his legs weren't, you know, sticking far out from the seats. Like he really learned how to shrink himself. So people wouldn't be intimidated by him because he noticed that when he got taller, um, people would put stuff in the seat next to them um, when it was an available seat. And he said that happened so much, it just changed how he even gets on the train. Right, well, and that's kind of a good segue because we can watch one more audiogram. We can watch Solomon who, who speaks oh. to that because he's 16, but yet he himself faced a growth spurt and looks much older and the different reactions that he got just, you know, just from, from that. Yeah. So let's, let's watch that together. My name is Solomon Smith. I am 16 years of age and I go to Kenwood Academy. I like to think of myself as like a fun and outgoing person. I like to be around a lot of people. It's usually where I feel, you know, most comfortable. When I was in Hyde Park walking to pick up my little sister and this lady who couldn't have been 40 years old, she had to be like 35 at the most, short, white lady, like long brown hair. She's carrying her purse, it was like at her elbow. And then when I turned into that street because from Kenwood, you have to make a left to go onto the street to pick up Murray. She like pulled her purse onto her shoulder and kind of clutched it with both hands. Like she put her elbow through so like, I could barely see the purse at that point. And I just like, at first it just, I was just confused about the action, but then it like kind of dawned upon me like what it meant. It didn't feel too good. I just felt like there was nothing I could have done better in that situation, like for someone to react that way about me, just based off the way I looked. It was just, it was kind of heartbreaking to experience because like, so I first like kind of processed it, I guess, when I actually got to Murray and I sat down waiting for my sister to get out the program she was in. I was angry, but I was also more so sad at the instance. Like usually you hear stuff like that just doesn't happen in Hyde Park. And so when it happened, I was just kind of like shocked. I don't know, I just, it just, it really, left a really bad taste in my mouth because I just, it didn't make me feel good. Like for the rest of that night and like the day after that, I was just stuck thinking about it because I don't think I could have changed anything about the situation. Like I couldn't have made her feel safe or whatever. I was just walking up the street. I kind of, even now I'm, a, I, I'm pretty big and I also look a lot older than I am. So I feel like that, I guess, plays a part into it. Cause like, I mean, I'm like six foot one, 215. When it comes to like the black persona, like how people are, black people are described, like, you know, this whole gang banging, this, that, and four, five, never done anything like that. So I feel like I'm more of like a, a bystander in this type of thing. So I feel like people just affiliate those negative things to people who have nothing to do with it. We're just kids, I suppose. Like, we're people too. Like, I feel like that fear is just unwarranted. So just to treat people as people, I think that's where it all starts for, just having empathy for people and understanding that though we may come from different walks of life, we're just as human as everyone else. So I feel like that equal treatment is justifiable. I'm still trying to figure it out personally. I just feel that racism is something that's, it starts with people and ends with people, I feel like. So I feel like, there, we're not gonna solve racism or anything like that through like legislation or anything like that. I feel like we need to have like conversations with people. So I feel like the one thing, you know, as a final note that I'll leave people with is just uh, try to show empathy. Like even people who are racist, I still believe deserve a chance to become educated. I feel like just ignoring them, putting them all into this box of racists is how we breed more generations of racism. Okay, and I think that, you know, Solomon kind of talks about just what we were talking about before, um, quite elegantly. Um, we're almost out of time. It's, it's... I know Lauren and Solomon, I was like, they talk 
so much better than me. <laughs> I was like, I was not that articulate at that age. <laughs> No, they, 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 you know, both of their stories are very powerful and impactful. And, you know, coming from being so young and be able to be, you know, talk that way and express their feelings, I think is, is good. And hopefully, you know, like you said, those are our future leaders. And so, um, what I would like to do right now, just, I would love to talk forever, but we're running low. I think we have seven minutes left. So, um, if anyone has a question that they would like to pose to Tanika or the panelists, um, you can type it in in the question answer section on the bottom of your screen, and um, I'd be happy to to share it with the panelists. So if anyone wants to do that right now, go ahead. Don't be shy. <laughs> Maybe we did such a great job. That must be it, right? We just covered it. all our bases. They don't have anything else to think <laughs> that. Well, then I'll leave it with um, Jill. Maybe, maybe I'll let Jill and Sarah finish it off. Maybe Jill has a question and Sarah, and then we can say, say goodnight. So. <laughs> OK. I think it was a real pleasure, and I really enjoyed it. Um, so maybe for the people in the audience, too, if you want to learn photography, um, we have some classes over at, in the visual communications department. If you're inspired by this film and want to start your own project and don't know how, that would yes. be, that'd be great. And I was reading a little bit about you and I are both uh, alumni from Columbia College, Chicago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I graduated in 2000 with that. Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> yes, I would encourage the photographers out there, um, learn film. <laughs> <laughs> Learn film and use digital. <laughs> That's what I would suggest. <laughs> it was so brutal, right, Jill? Oh, oh, oh yeah, gosh. the slides, the Cibachrome in your set. <laughs> no choice but to learn how to work in camera. Writing the settings down and then getting it developed and then comparing it with the, oh my gosh. I was so happy when digital happened. <laughs> but I wouldn't know how to use digital. Well, first of all, I still shoot on manual, even with my digital. So oh, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's that. Um, but yeah, if I didn't go through that torture of film, um, I wouldn't really know how to use my digital camera to the fullest of its capabilities. So yeah, learn film. Or just put your digital on manual. That's right. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Um, well, I would just like to say thank you very much for the opportunity and that we could ask some questions. And I think this is a really important topic to share and everything. I wanted to ask one more question and it was, how has COVID impacted your neighborhood in compared to other neighborhoods? Oh, my God. <laughs> I mean, I think that's kind of like a long question. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's good. Um, so, one, uh, just dramatically different. Like, a lot of the residents from this neighborhood, um, are essential workers, you know. Um, they work in retail, they work in uh, post offices, they were, you know, so um, they've been going to work or, or they've been deeply impacted, financially impacted by not being able to have as many hours. And also just the fact that um, this neighborhood includes you know a population that is vulnerable um older black people with pre-existing diseases and so uh people are very very cautious um i know that i went to i went to lincoln park to go to a store because that's also an impact um the stores have very limited hours in this neighborhood as a result of not only COVID, but the lootings that happened. 
And so now the stores have limited hours, which means that you oftentimes have to go outside of the neighborhood far to, you know, get your essentials. And I went to Lincoln Park and I was like, wow, like you wouldn't even realize that it's a pandemic because, <laughs> you know, everyone is out. They have stores to go to. Everyone is out, um, restaurants in the neighborhood. And so it just definitely feels different here. You don't see a lot of that um you know, social entertainment activity going on. People are usually going to the store or going home. And a lot of the interactions you have are with your friends, if they're neighbors. Um, I've been lucky enough to, to be able to have my, my quarantine base uh, not be that far um, outside of my home because my friends who I was with right when the pandemic hit don't stay far from me. But other than that, um, you know, it's definitely not as much socializing as other neighborhoods um, because we have blocks in this neighborhood that don't have a lot of lived-in homes. We have vacant homes on some blocks so you can't do the cute stuff like sing-alongs on the block or come outside and stay across the street and do something cute, play tic-tac-toe in the window, whatever. You know, I saw all that cute stuff and I was like, oh man, that's so nice. So we don't have a lot of that. Um, and then the other, you know, kind of depressing thing was that when the looting happened and, and the stores were boarded up, you really couldn't even tell which stores were boarded up because of the looting, because we have so many stores, vacant stores and homes that were already boarded up. So it didn't really look that different. Um, but also, um, the way people come together as a result of not only struggling through the systemic issues, but COVID, um, some really beautiful things have, have come about. <clears throat> um, people started doing grocery deliveries very early on in the pandemic um, because we knew that that was going to be an issue. Um, and then also people from outside the neighborhood came to, to help. Um, that's actually how the MAP twins, the first MAP twins, Wade, Jennifer, and Nanette, how they decided to start their project because um, Wade and Jennifer brought groceries to their MAP twin, Nanette. They even brought me groceries that first week after the pandemic because I like salmon. I like stuff. I couldn't get it. <laughs> and so they, they brought me some groceries and a lot of people were doing stuff like that. So even with those like that huge disparity, um, a lot of connectivity still occurred and still happened. So there's the, the bittersweet part about that. Yes, definitely. Well, um, I think that concludes our evening. I don't wanna keep anyone past their bedtime. <laughs> but this was, this was really a great event. Tanika, I can't thank you enough thank for, you for agreeing to do this. It, it was wonderful. And I'm so glad Triton students got to meet you, faculty and the community. Yes. And if they want to follow me on Instagram, if they don't mind, you know, some older person, you know, in their feed, <laughs> they can follow me. I follow back. Um, and if oh. they come up with questions after that, they can definitely DM me. My Instagram is Tonika J, T O N I K A J. Um, I mean, I'm on Facebook, but they're probably not even into that. So don't even. <laughs> uh, well, some of them are following our, we have a Facebook music page and a Facebook uh, oh, okay. visual communication. So I will post your Instagram link on our Facebook okay, page cool. as well. So I have just for, before we go in the chat box, I posted a website to direct you to Tanika's homepage, um, mm -hmm. The Belonging Project. So you can see that virtually. Um, also, you know, Triton's, our music page and our visual communications page. So. You can keep up to date with events and follow Tanika. Jill, thank you so much. Um, again, she's a great teacher. Take some photography <laughs> classes. Sarah, yeah. you're, Sarah, you're awesome. Really, you did a great job. And again, my name's Sal Seriano. Thank you all. Thank you, Tanika, again. Um, I just want to really quickly acknowledge um, the people that helped make this possible and are funding this. Um, President uh, Mary Rita Moore, Vice President Dr. Susan Campos, our Dean of Arts and Sciences, Kevin Lee, our Dean of College Readiness, uh, Rick Segovia, and our 
uh, visual communication, sorry, I always say it wrong. I'm <laughs> visual performing and communication arts department chairperson, Dennis McNamara. So thank you all for your continued support. Our next event is November 18th. We will have um, Michael Geraldo from, uh, presenting his Aztec Stories presentation. So hope to see you soon. Thank you again, Jill, Tanika, Sarah. Have a great night. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye -bye. Nice to meet you. We'll be in touch. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.